Hey, how you doing guys? Hey, we're here to talk about a bit of server storage planning. There's two parts, so I'm going to kind of keep this to a, a two part series. Um, so right here, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the server and storage planning conceptual. So what that means is this is just the thinking piece, right? So this is really important. Um, the other video will actually be the actual true planning realistically. So it's a kind of important to understand why the conceptual piece is good and then why the actual planning uh, itself is important because what the conceptual will do is, is it'll give you the insight to conduct the actual research because most people just confuse planning as like, oh, okay, I got A, B, and C, and this is the best choice. I'm going to go with this. So by understanding basic concepts and basic uh, like processes, it will save you a lot of time and grief. So basically, I'm you're probably here on this page, but I do have a YouTube video attached to it. So I bring up the first thing to kind of just open up here, right? And this is the, the point I'm trying to bring up here. So a lot of people, when they start with purchasing servers or getting servers, they really don't really think about what they're really getting, right? Part of it is because the inexperience with Linux, and I, and I don't blame them because I did kind of the same thing. The thing too is, is that Linux is a little bit complicated to add disk. Yeah, it's, it's not like just Windows, you just drop a disk and, and move it. So there's a lot of... Uh, uh, workarounds and things that you have to do and that you have to think about. So in this scenario right here, we're talking about you get a hundred gig disk space. You're like, okay, I just wanna, I just wanna have a server that does some light downloading and some light uploading, and have some, you know, maybe like some light torrents and some users watching, and I should be good to go, right? So a hundred gig disk sounds pretty good, right? Except you know, you do have a large Plex library, something else a lot of people don't factor, right? So let's say your Plex metadata ticks about 35 gigs. This 35 gigs can easily be accomplished by having about, I'd say about a thousand TV shows and maybe like 5,000 movies, maybe, maybe, maybe even double that. It really just depends on how many TV episodes that you have in going into that. So it's really fairly easy to achieve. My meta gig data is about 70 gigs. So it, it can get kind of big when you kind of grow from there. Right. So Right now, you have to also factor that sonar and radar takes up space. So if you're using use um, Usenet, uh, sonar and radar both take up space themselves because they do download disk covers. Uh, I've had, I mean, covers and stuff. So currently, my sonar sits around 10 gigs and my radar sits around 3 gigs. So that's you're talking about 13 gigs alone just in those two programs. Another thing, too, is, is remember how we were talking about light movement of files. Now, what you have to remember, too, is that files don't always immediately move, right? Because sometimes there's garbage that just builds. There's files that get a little lost. I know it sounds like, hey, shit, this shouldn't happen, but it kind of does. Usenet is pretty efficient, but sometimes there's just leftover garbage behind. Um, also, you have to factor that you might be pending uploads. So maybe you hit a 24-hour upload ban, which is rare to kind of set it up. I mean, to achieve that the way we have things set up. But um, you can have slow bandwidth going up. So you may have like a, a fast down and a slow up. So you have to factor pending up uploads, right? And then I was just kind of joking here, 10 gigs of random garbage files left by NZB Git. So if you don't really pay attention, there's garbage files that can accumulate on your system like anything else, right? And then for some reason, you're just torrenting. Why, why do you torrent? I don't know, uh, other than maybe to obtain rare files. And the best thing I tell about people like, hey, look, if you got a torrent and stuff is just that unique, just make Plex friends, right? So um, it's great. You know, I have some Plex friends and, um, you know, if I don't have it, then, you know, I'm, I'm, to be honest with you, I usually use the search function. <laughs> so if it's on my server, I primarily use my server. And then if I don't have it, then I just use the other. So it kind of works out pretty great. So um, that's my argument against the uh, torrenting piece, unless you're just really obsessed about having it for your users. So... Now that we talked about all the space here, does this even seem kind of realistic, right? So it really doesn't. So the problem is you got Plex eating a bunch of space, this eating a bunch of space. So these alone will take like 45 to 50 gigs, right? And then you got to remember your OS has got pending updates and garbage things that just build up in Linux over time. Um, you got pending uploads. And here's another thing. The pending uploads is scary because there's really no way to cap how much your downloads are going to fill your hard drive unless you set a minimum space. With NZ, like with the program. So like in uh, Zab NZBD, I think I've managed to program it to where it does 25 gigs. I probably might need to up it. But the, the only reason I don't is because I know some people have some low-end VPSs, so that might screw with people. Um, 
And then again, the random garbage, I really can't help you with that. We do have some scripts that do remove like certain files that are older that just kind of like lay around and are unprocessed. And then seeding. So, you know, um, torrenting is not the best thing to do with these kind of setups, unless you just got like four terabytes of space and you just love seeding and, and you know, because you, you're going to have a bunch of files uploading to your Google Drive. So seeding just kind of complicates the process. And then, well, you're seeding. It's just more bandwidth going out of your server along with processing. So there's a reason why I kind of bring this thing to talk about things. I wish somebody would have kind of introduced me to that. I kind of knew some of this, but I, I did and didn't. Because, again, with Linux, if you're using the command line, you're not really thinking about it. Most of you who experience this in Windows, you'll just run out of disk space and it'll just, it's really obvious when your Plex server crashes. So usually you'll just end up deleting a bunch of, you know, metadata or, or, um, you know, the cache file with, with the, uh, with like excessive uh, transcodes just laying around. So there's ways of like clearing out things, but Linux is just, it's always complicated to hunt down files. So with the server and storage planning conceptual, I'm a, I'm a certified project manager in real life. I, I have a, do have an IT focus. I do have business certs, but uh, project management does come into play. And I love project management um, because what it does, it kind of gives a framework and how to look at things. And so what you have to understand is uh, before actual planning, remember how we were talking about planning again, you need to understand some basic concepts. So in here, we talk about scope management. So people just think a scope is really easy to just set. You know, it's like, hey, I'm going to do this and that's it, right? So a scope right now is for, so it's something that you define before even planning. It's what is, it's basically, what is what is the purpose of your project? What is the, the setup and a reasoning for it? And if there is a reasoning for it, is it sustainable via cost, the actual server that you have? and with the infrastructure right because if those don't meet then you're going to have problems along the way so for example if you decide to get a hundred dollar monthly server but it's something that does not fit within your scope your scope is to have a, a server for fifty dollars and you think you're going to collect funds um you know be, be aware that people can be cheap then you, you may have some scope issues there so you need to define a goal an end state and process in between while balancing your resources to accomplish the mission so poor planning and with along with scope management and everything else is going to just end up resulting in failure and altering those things or crashing resources is going to end up with a thing known as scope creep. So scope creep is like, you see like these guys in the picture right here, it's like when they start moving that thing around. So you want to get to the bullseye. So if you're like, well, okay, okay, uh, the server costs hundred bucks, but I, I can't get the donation. So you know, I'm gonna put on a credit card, you know, I know it sounds like a cheesy example, but that's something that's realistic, right? And then you're paying interest on a credit card, and you're like, this isn't sustainable anymore. Um, so identifying what resources and things that you have way beforehand would have saved you a lot of time. So you don't want to create unnecessary and unrealistic goals, right? So if your goal is just share a server with five people, then plan for five people and stick with it, you probably can uh, add a six or seven and you know, but if they're all if they're all going to be on and they're all setting their bit rates high and your server only has a 100 megabit connection and you don't limit the, the rate, then, yeah, you're going to just end up with a series of problems. So it doesn't make a little sense. So this is just something for you to think about. You know what I mean? So, um, again, I wish I I wish I had somebody kind of tell me this in the beginning. So stakeholder management. So this sounds like common sense, right? Uh, I know what a stakeholder is. It's people who really care, right? So the problem is when it comes to this, a lot of people really don't care. You're the guy with the server, the resources, and you're helping people out. So you need to define who your stakeholders are. So you, uh, there are people who do different things with Plex and MB servers. There are people who sell services, which I would not highly recommend at all. And there are people who um, just want to set up a Plex server so mom and dad can watch TV. Um, so... Stakeholders are important because you got to know where your stakeholders are, their location, if they're donating to you or not. Uh, what bit rates are they using? Are they going to use duplicate IPs? Do your stakeholders, are they people that just like to argue with you? Are they going to call you or text you and ask for consistent content? So you got to think about all these different things, right? So your server location is going to matter a lot because if your server is located in the United States, but all your, I don't know, your users that you just love to share with are all located in Europe, that might be problematic, right? Because, you know, bandwidth, hop, lag, all that good stuff occurs, right? 
unless you use a CDN or whatever that is. So but I'm not going to lie to you. I haven't personally used it, but um, you got to, you got to figure out where your, your users are. And then right here, do I charge for upkeep? And so how will that work? This right here is important because this can really discourage you. You know, you may end up buying a big server and then, you know, you realize that your stakeholders are problematic. You have to be aware of what this too is because if you decide to like, charge for services, you're making yourself a target. That's not the whole purpose of creating these services. Like, like for example, Plex for me is just a hobby. I just love Plex. I have Spotify. I have uh, Google Music. Uh, which, uh, I have uh, Netflix. I do have uh, AT&T Watch you. So I have a lot of these paid services, right? I do not sell services either. I just have it as a hobby. And it's very convenient for me to watch all my stuff through one user interface along with assisting some family members. So you have to understand that's what is your goal here? Do I give users admin rights to my programs? This is something that people have to think about. So for example, if you didn't set up a proxy, you didn't set up port guard, nap guard, you know, and, and a guy, let's say he's paying you $20 a month and he's like kind of like a co sponsor with your project. Do you give them admin rights to your program? Let, do you like, Hey, yeah, just go to my IP address and you know, admin is admin and passwords, password, and you can do what you need. So you need to be wary of this is because an uneducated user may end up giving out your credentials. Um, they may have a computer full of spyware and again, they may give out your credentials. So, uh, I never give people access to my Google drive. I never give people access to my admin rights. I do have people that hit me up and say, Hey, can I just go on your team drive bar? No. Cause once you open yourself up, um, you're going to at a risk of security. Uh, you're going to be a target of the industry you don't want to do this stuff. You know, um, you do always want to support the industry. And, uh, again, you just want to do this as a hobby project. So, Identify your stakeholders, identify what issues you might have with them, their locations and all this stuff. Because if you do that, your experience is going to be a little bit smoother. So finally, for this conceptual planning right here, because you can see right here, the realistic one I'm working on um, is cost management. So cost management here is insanely key because this is going to drive whether you're going to run this project or not. So um, I had a, a chat with somebody who was like spending like $500 a month on servers to, to do what he loved. Um, which is outrageous. I'm like, hey, you can just, here's the cost of $100, so you send them 400 my way monthly. So um, what what they failed to do was, is kind of like what we talked about. They failed to identify the scope of reasoning and, and they just wanted everything and everything. They were running, you know, ESXi and multiple VMs with eight cores and it was, it was bad. Like they had a 40 core server, uh, crazy specs, but it was a little overkill. Um, and the irony was they didn't use SSDs. They had two rated standard hard drives, which gives them 200 megabits per speed. Basically like, um, it was basically like uh 20% of the speed of a, yeah, 20%, 20. Yeah. So about 20% the speed of an SSD. So, um, you got to understand what you're purchasing, what you're getting, what equipment you're getting. Uh, what you want to get it from, it may be cheaper for you to run two Plex servers. You know, you, let's say you get a great deal and you have five users and on one and five users on another, why you do that, I don't know, but you may discover that running two $30 servers may be better than running one large hundred dollar server going that route. Maybe because you want backup on the other server, who knows? Uh, but stuff like that can really drive what you decide to do. So understand that the cost of everything that you do is going to be near and dear to you. If you're running this at home, that's great. But then do you have the bandwidth to support the out? Are you in an area where like, for example, evil Comcast uh, and evil Cox have decided to follow its footsteps? Uh, these companies, you know, are, you know, if you exceed that one terabyte cap, you know, are you going to pay it at $50 unlimited, you know, because you're like, wait, I don't need to upload because I do a lot of download. You know, there, there's different things you may do. So you may incur a lot of cost yourself with like zero benefit other than learning how to manage a lot of data in Plex. So, but other than that, uh, I do appreciate your time for you listening to me to ramble on. Again, I really just tell you this because I really care about you um, and what you do and uh, understanding these basic concepts and why the conceptual piece is important. Please feel free to watch the continuing video when this whole part's finished about the realistic planning. So like actual concrete things that you will do um, but other than that, you have an outstanding day and please subscribe, like, and comment. And I do appreciate donations and I do appreciate you just being a member, interactive member community. Have a good one. All right.